This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. This video is intended for healthcare personnel involved in performing emergency endotracheal intubation in patients with suspected or proven infection with severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2, which causes the respiratory illness COVID-19. Endotracheal intubation in patients with COVID-19 poses a risk of infection for the healthcare personnel involved in the procedure. Meticulous planning, preparation, and practice drills can minimize the risk of contagion and enhance safety. The use of a printed checklist that includes each step involved in emergency intubation in patients presumed to be infected with SARS-CoV-2 is strongly encouraged. In order to adhere to infection control measures that minimize exposure to the virus, this video was filmed in a simulated environment and demonstrates one approach to intubation with the use of a mannequin. The technique may vary depending on institutional guidelines and the available equipment. To minimize the exposure of healthcare workers to SARS-CoV-2, limit the number of staff present during endotracheal intubation. The intubation team may consist of four operators who have predefined jobs. The first and second operators will don personal protective equipment, or PPE, and enter the patient's room. The PPE should include at least a respirator with a rating of N95 or higher, a gown, gloves, and eye protection. The first operator is the team member with the highest level of expertise in airway management and will perform all the procedures that require direct contact with the patient, including preoxygenation, endotracheal intubation, and securing the endotracheal tube. The second operator assists the first operator by administering medications and operating the ventilator and monitors. This person does not come in direct contact with the patient except in the event of a difficult airway or cardiac arrest. The third and fourth operators monitor the activities from outside the patient's room and remain ready to don PPE and assist in the event of a difficult airway or cardiac arrest. Ideally, endotracheal intubation should be performed in a negative pressure isolation room. However, this may not always be possible. Medications and airway equipment should be prepared outside the patient's room and only necessary equipment should be brought into the patient's room. The following should be available at the patient's bedside, an electrocardiographic monitor, a pulse oximeter, a means to detect exhaled carbon dioxide, such as a colorimetric chemical test or capnography, a non-invasive blood pressure monitor, a functioning suction catheter, and a back valve device, which can be tested by sealing the back valve device connector with your thumb and squeezing the bag to confirm that positive pressure can be delivered. This back valve device is equipped with a positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, valve, which can be useful to reduce alveolar collapse and increase oxygenation. Prepare the following equipment prior to entering the patient's room. A video laryngoscope, or if not available, a direct laryngoscope. A coughed endotracheal tube of appropriate size. An endotracheal tube stylet. An air syringe a face mask of appropriate size to achieve a good seal, an oropharyngeal airway, a means to secure the endotracheal tube such as adhesive tape or a tube holder, and high-efficiency viral filters. In addition, an accessory airway card with equipment for difficult airway management such as a bougie, a laryngeal mask airway, or LMA, and a fiber optic bronchoscope should be available. For patients in whom a difficult airway is suspected, arrangements should be made for emergency front-of-neck access. A cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, card should be available. Prior to entering the patient's room, prepare the essential drugs for the procedure, including an intravenous hypnotic agent such as propofol, midazolam, ketamine, or etomidate, depending on the patient's clinical status, drug availability, and the preference of the first operator, and a rapid-acting neuromuscular blocking agent such as succinylcholine or rocuronium. Consider also preparing inotropes and vasopressors such as ephedrine and phenylephrine.
plan for rapid sequence induction to reduce the duration of the procedure. A rapid sequence induction may be modified for patients in whom even a brief period of apnea would be an unacceptable risk. Remove the patient's surgical mask just before preoxygenation. If a patient is already receiving supplemental oxygen using high flow nasal cannula or non invasive ventilation, consider leaving them in place until ready to attempt intubation. Administer 100% oxygen to the patient for 3 to 5 minutes while the patient breathes spontaneously. Fit the patient with a well sealed face mask to minimize dissemination of respiratory droplets and aerosols. Use the lowest oxygen flow needed to achieve adequate preoxygenation. If the patient has difficulty breathing while in the supine position, you can elevate the head of the bed temporarily to perform preoxygenation. In some patients, the use of a flow inflating bag may be preferred to avoid the inspiratory resistance of a back valve device. After preoxygenation, the second operator administers the hypnotic and neuromuscular blocking agents. Ensure a complete neuromuscular block before attempting endotracheal intubation. Use a peripheral nerve stimulator or wait 30 to 60 seconds, depending on the agents and the doses used. Perform the endotracheal intubation using a video laryngoscope and a stylated endotracheal tube. Some operators prefer to have a viral filter connected to the endotracheal tube during intubation. However, using a viral filter precludes using a stylet, which is often needed to guide the tube through the glottis during endotracheal intubation with video laryngoscopy. Remove the stylet from the endotracheal tube and inflate the endotracheal tube cough to seal the airway before attempting ventilation. Then, connect the breathing apparatus to the endotracheal tube with a viral filter placed closest to the tube. Corroborate that the endotracheal tube has been placed correctly by detecting carbon dioxide using either a colorimetric chemical test or capnography. Observe the rise and fall of the patient's chest. To reduce the risk of contamination, avoid using a stethoscope. Secure the endotracheal tube. Several problems can arise during endotracheal intubation in critically ill patients, ranging from relatively minor to life-threatening complications, such as inability to ventilate the lungs and hemodynamic collapse. If progressive desaturation occurs after the administration of anesthetic drugs, initiate small volume positive pressure ventilation with a face mask and expedite endotracheal intubation. If endotracheal intubation is not successful on the first attempt, administer small volume positive pressure ventilation through a face mask. The second operator may assist the first operator for endotracheal intubation by adjusting the patient's position or the position of the bed performing external laryngeal manipulation to provide a better view during laryngoscopy or providing the first operator with airway adjuncts. If endotracheal intubation fails on the second attempt, the second operator may attempt to perform the intubation. Continue to maintain adequate oxygenation by using small volume positive pressure ventilation with a face mask. If face mask ventilation is not adequate, insert an LMA. If ventilation is not possible through the LMA, or, if critical desaturation occurs, emergency front-of-neck access to the airway should be performed. In cases of cardiac arrest, the first and second operators should commence resuscitation immediately in accordance with the guidelines for advanced cardiac life support. The third and fourth operators should put on PPE and enter the intubation room to assist with CPR. Other healthcare personnel may provide assistance as necessary after donning appropriate PPE. Emergency intubation of patients with COVID-19 requires meticulous planning, preparation, and practice drills. The development of institutional guidelines helps to mitigate patient complications and enhance the safety of healthcare personnel.